and thank all of you for having me. I'm, I'm very, very pleased and, and honored uh, to, to be part of your lecture series. And I'm very impressed that, that you all turn out for a two-hour time slot on Friday, since um, I'm going to try to fill it up with interesting things today. And, and I'm also pleased because this is a, a sort of continuation of, of a lot of fruitful connections I've been having recently with your museum. Um, a few years back, I worked closely with Kamar Adamji on um, the Maharaja show, which, which featured at both of our venues. And currently, the, the Himalayan uh, exhibition that Peter mentioned, um, um, the, the, other, the other half of, of, of the, the working crew on that is your curator, uh, Jeffrey Durham. And so this is a, a show that he and I are putting together and will feature here as well as in Virginia and hopefully a third venue as well. Um, in addition, uh, Forrest McGill has, has recently asked for some, for some loans for his Ramayana show that's coming up and I'm, and I'm sure that we'll be able to fill those. So there are lots of, of sort of things coming together between, between me and, and VMFA and, and the Asian Art Museum. And in addition, um, and I don't know if she's here, but, but a dear colleague from my museum has recently joined your staff. Um, our former head of objects uh, conservation, Kathy Gillis, is now your head of conservation. And, and um, you're, you're blessed to have her uh, um, as you are your, your wonderful staff. Every, everyone uh, in curatorial and now conservation that I've worked with here. Um, you're, you, you're in good hands, and, and it's great to be here. Thank you. Uh, so today's program, and this is, you know, this is marketing here. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm compelled to put that up. And, and it will the, the VMFA will follow us all the way through. Um, but today I'm here to consider one of, your, one of your designated iconic objects, your opulent silver Indian howdah. And as the title of my talk suggests, um, I will also talk quite a bit about a second howda. Um, in fact, your howda's Virginia cousin, which is housed in my museum in Richmond, and you see them both here. So your wonderful howda. Um, and and, and I'm, I'm glad we got to do that study guide. So, so I, there are only a few slides that have writing on them, that, which I think makes it nice for, for everybody. Um, but your howda and then ours. So for the first half of uh, my program, I want to take a sort of wider view of these objects. Um, of course, explaining what they are, but then looking at the historical context in which they were fashioned. And then after the break, um, I want to zoom in more and, and take a more detailed look at the San Francisco and the Richmond howdas and try to see what, um, what, a, what a closer look might reveal about questions that, that have, since, since these have been acquired, have not really um, been adequately answered as of yet. So, um, we'll just start with, with, with what are these things? Um, so a howdah is a, is a sort of, Indo-Anglicized um, Indo word uh, from basically from, from Arabic and through Persian and Urdu. Um, it was originally a litter carried by a camel or an elephant, um, but in the Indian context, almost always by elephants. And almost always has two compartments, front and back, uh, the, the front one for the, the important person. Um, who is on display, and then the rear compartment for, for attendants who would have held regalia, um, marking the, the importance of the person in the front. Regalia including um, the umbrellas that you see, uh, parasols, as well as fly whisks and, and, and other sort of emblems of royalty. Um, so howda is usually translated as elephant saddle. Um, but in our cases, I think it's more appropriate to think of them as elephant thrones. Um, I also, on your study guide, I, sent, I gave you a link, and I'm not going to I'm not going to make you um, watch the video here. But there's a link to a video, "How to Dress Your Elephant," which was um, part of the the Maharaja show, um, and then featured here as well. Um, this. 
is just obviously showing how to end use with, with uh, a king uh, from Rajasthan there. And th you see some of the regalia as well, and you, you get the idea of the sort of grand pomp and ceremony that, that would have surrounded uh, the king's riding on his howda on the elephant. Um, these are just a, a, a couple stills from that video, and, and I'd encourage you to watch it if you haven't. It gives you a, a, a good idea to some of the basic questions about, you know, how are these things strapped on the elephant. But the, the one thing that I was disappointed at um, is that, that the V&A and then, then likewise you guys, when you took this on, um, missed the perfect opportunity to, to, name, to, to change the name for this. But see, I think it should be Howda how to dress an elephant. Um, but, and that's, that's my one lame joke for the, probably the whole thing, okay. Um, but anyway, it's, it's a fun thing to watch. Um, so, as you might imagine, um, elephants and howdahs are, were, were uh, things mostly, they, they were the things of kings reserved for the, for the ruling classes. Elephants um, were long important to Indian kingship, both symbolically and practically. Um, the, the elephant is the, as the largest and one of the smartest animals, um, um, is the, sort of the king, king of animals, as would be the, the king uh, who rode upon him. Uh, in Indian uh, mythology, uh, Hindu mythology, the, the king of the gods, Indra, rides upon a white elephant. So um, there's this sort of, this, this sort of resonance, this um, sort of back and forth uh, homologies between kings and gods, which I'll go into a little bit in, in Indic culture. Um, kings are known to have kept great stables of elephants. The Mughal emperor is said to have kept 101 elephants just for his personal use. Um, and I show you here uh, a famous structure in the Deccan in sort of south central India, a place called Vijayanagara, um, uh, an elephant stables. Um, so uh, I, I, it, it would be nice if there were a person in this frame, but, but these, these stalls are, are quite large, each one to hold one or more elephants. Of course, uh, elephants were very important um, to kingdoms, both militarily for use in armies and, and ritually throughout India. Um, um, elephants are, are very important to many Hindu temples keep elephants and use them for ceremonial processions and such. So, um, so how does we're, we're used for hunting, which was an activity uh, often reserved for royalty. See a couple hunting scenes here uh, from, from atop the howdah. Um, they were also used for warfare, certainly. Um, this uh, painting on the left is, is in your collection here, a uh, 19th century Pahari painting from the Ehrenfeld collection. But you see the, uh, the king there uh, leaving uh, the fort with, with his army um, on the way to having some manly fun. Um, and then, of, and then most importantly, especially for our discussions, how does were used for ceremonial processions. Processions mar marking coronations, royal birthdays, other dynastic events, um, and including cultic ceremonies as well. But um, the king would often, um, um, and the king and his, and his sort of family would often uh, be the only ones allowed to ride on the elephants. You see here, this is the, the Mughal emperor riding in a procession. This is from a much longer uh, painting, but this is the head of the procession with the Mughal emperor. Now, the importance of ceremonial processions um, uh, to Indian kingship really can't be uh, overstated. Um, and, and, and here I'm getting back to the, that sort of homology between uh, king and god, um, because a, a very important part of, of Hindu ritual. Um, oh, sorry, these are a couple more processions of kings. Um, we had the Mughal emperor before. Up top here we have uh, the Mysore, uh, Wodiyar uh, um, Maharaja, and down bottom uh, one of the Nizams of Hyderabad on his, on his uh, elephant and in his howdah. Um, 
ceremonial processions uh, have a long, long history in, in Hindu uh, ritual. And um, there are, I, I will show you instances uh, where, where elephants are used, but, um, but more commonly the, the, um, the deity, it, it kind of goes like this. The, the deity occasionally needs to come out of the temple and show himself or herself to the populace, many of, many of whom would not have been allowed to go into the temple and, and um, interact with the deity in that, in that um, more closed space. So periodically, the, the deity would, would, would be um, sort of taken out of, of, of his or her uh, permanent icon with usually a large stone, you know, heavy stone icon within the temple space. And the the sort of essence of the deity would be um, would be sort of um, conjured, probably not the right word, but out out of that uh, out of that um, um, permanent image, and and placed into a portable image, which would then be housed in essentially a moving temple. And and this is what you see here: these uh, examples of these large temple carts in which the deity would then be taken on procession through the town. Um, of course, marking sacred, you know, marking space. And, in, and most importantly, um, seeing uh, his or her populace and allowing them to see him. Um, th that, that sort of exchange of gaze is, is, is critical to, to Hindu devotion and ritual, uh, something called darshan. Um, where where the um, adherent and the deity exchange gaze, and that's sort of the the, the kernel of, of 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 Hindu ritual, really. So these are some examples of these processions in temple carts, and the the British, of course, were um, were blown away by this. They, they 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 found this very fascinating and interesting, and. And they recorded many of these uh, temple processions. And the most uh, famous of them was up in eastern India in a place called Puri, um, which you see a, a, a painting of here. And this was the temple in the background, um, the, the temple, the, the deity who resides in that temple, the main deity who resides there is a, is a fellow called uh, Jagannatha. And this, Seeing these these massive uh, processions um, on these big moving machines is where, of course, we get the, the English term juggernaut from from the the deity Jagannatha. And so the the British were mad for mad for this, you know, because it's so exotic and fun. Um, here's another uh, um, illustration of Juggernaut. You can actually see him better here inside his Juggernaut um, being pulled through the streets by throngs. And here's an example um, that shows that, that this sort of, of a ritual procession was also done on elephants. This is actually a Buddhist procession taking place in Sri Lanka but rather than the deity being um, placed in the portable uh, um, vessel, um, here in Kandy, uh, the, the important relic is, is you know, of course, the, the Buddha is not a deity, right? But we have his relics, and there's um, a tooth, um, purportedly uh, one of the Buddha's teeth, which gets placed in this um, reliquary um, mounted on a halda, essentially, on the back of an elephant, and taken on one of these uh, ritual processions through Candy. Um, Candy is the name of the town. Um, um, uh, and as you can see here, um, surrounded by all the sorts of regalia that, that we see um, around kings when they're also um, processed through town, um, allowing them to see their populace and for their populace to see them, a demonstration of power and also of just great pomp and, and ceremony. Um, 
So, and, and, and keep in mind that, that there are practical reasons that a king should ride on an elephant as well. I'm, I mean, it's the sort of safest place for a king uh, to show himself in, in, a, in a great throng is up high on, on a very uh, powerful animal. But to me, you know, there's, there's very little difference in what's going on here between this and this. So... Let's return to, for a moment anyway, to, to our particular haldas that, that we're discussing. Um, in order to start locating ourselves a little, that was sort of the grand view of, of, of haldas and elephants in, in Indian culture. Um, but now we need to, to narrow down um, and, and consider uh, more specifically the historical context in, in that long tradition that we're dealing with. Um, as I flashed up those, those um, we, at my museum we call them dog tags. I've also heard them called tombstones, but the, you know, the sort of where, when um, information. I showed you that on, on previous screens, and you may have noticed that, that they, other than um, the funds with which they were bought, um, our Halda and your Halda carry the exact same information in terms of where and when. Um, and I will come back to the where um, at, at some length, but for the moment, let's just consider the, the when part, this circa 1870 to 1920 that, that both of our museums have decided to, to um, put on, on the labels. So this is, and, and I think even if, you ha if I hadn't put this um, um, dog tag down here, you probably could have any one of you probably could have told me these are 19th century. I mean, wh where else are you going to see um, something in this style, which is it's something that, that is as much sort of Victorian furniture um, as it is anything particularly Indian. So these are products of, of the period of the British Raj in India. And so I want to consider with you that period briefly. So the Raj is um, the, the term that is used. Um, it it's basically means r rule, um, an Indian word meaning rule. But it's the, it's the term used for the period of crown rule, of British crown rule in India. So 1858 to 1947. Um, and I just wanted to show you a map of India. It's always useful to remind people that, that India... Um, until very recently has been much bigger than, than, than what we think of India today, you know, which has been carved down quite a bit. Um, and so this is the period that we're dealing with, and, and I want to point out to you, um, of course, the, the British had been de facto rulers of large swaths of India well before 1858, um, under, the, the, un, un, under the, the British East India Company. Uh, it was only in 58 that um, basically the crown stepped in and said, we're, we're going to take it from here. And that was um, in the aftermath of the, the two-year struggle, 1857-58, of, of what we call, um, de depending on who you are, you call it the, the, Indian, the, group, the Indian mutiny um, or, or the, the first war of Indian, de in, Indian independence. But... Um, so it was in the aftermath of quelling that um, um, attempted uprising against the British that the Crown steps in and, and says, you know, it dissolves the, the East India Company and, and takes over direct control. But it's important to realize that when they took over direct control, um, or, or rather that they only took over direct control of about three-fifths of the subcontinent. The other two-fifths um, continued to be ruled or independently governed by, and the numbers vary, but 500 plus large and small principalities um, with, with whom, of course, um, the Raj had entered into treaties of, of mutual co cooperation. So de facto, uh, the British are ruling the whole thing, but for, for everything in yellow, they're, they're ruling indirectly. Um, everything in pink is, is, is direct rule. Um, but this is important because um, it, it, it shows you that you have these 500-odd um, principalities which are um, 
being, being run by the Indian Rajas, who were formerly heads of independent states, but they, but they of course, became vassals under the British Empire. Um, and, and when they were prevented from exercising any real power, they could only demonstrate their strength through lavish displays of pomp and ceremony. And so this is going to take us back to our processions and howdahs. The, also keep in mind that throughout the 19th century, there's a sort of growing fervor and an intense interest in India back in Britain and an intense interest with the material culture of India. And, and a, a nice um, sort of obvious marker of this is the 1851 Great Exhibition um, in the Crystal Palace in London. Um, and of course, thing, uh, there were exhibits from, from all over the world, um, um, but by far, reportedly, the, the most popular of those exhibits was the Indian Pavilion, which you're seeing a bit of here. And the centerpiece of that pavilion, along with, uh, along with a big diamond, the Kohinoor, um, was the, this uh, elephant, this the taxidermied elephant, and, and the howdah on which it rode. Um, um, or rather the other way around, H horse and cart, you know, the howdah on top of it. Um, so uh, the British were, were, were familiar with, with howdahs and, and, and very interested in, in, um, in, the, in the sort of lavish... Um, um, opulence of, of, of Indian court traditions. And what I'd like to um, just run through here briefly is, is, is a, a sort of example that, that I'm going to, to give of how in the 19th century there was a, that, that the 19th century in India was a sort of period of, of increasing um, sort of cultural hybridity between Indian things and, and Anglo things. And, you know, the British were adopting cultural forms and customs of the Indian elite and vice versa. You know, so this is at the, at the, the, the sort of top tiers of culture. There's this, this mixing and hybridity. And, and um, to, uh, well, be, because there are things in, in the Virginia collection, it's easy to show you. I'm going to use it as an example of this um, some of the silver from our um, Raj period silver collection that we have in Virginia. Um, and, and so this, this is, I'll, I'll show you a few different types of objects. These are um, tea services, obviously. But here's an early, uh, early 19th century example here. Um, the British in India um, at that point were, were commissioning um, usually European silversmiths in India, but European silversmiths to create their table services, their table wares, um, in the, the Western style, you know. Um, they sort of wanted to be reminded of what it was like back home. But as you, as you sort of progress through the century, those forms become sort of more and more mixed with, with, with Indian forms. And, and so um, you have many, many examples of basically uh, um, British, British type objects sort of being decorated with, 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 um, with ornament that, that is very Indian. But then you, but then you also have uh, increasingly the sort of, um, the, the, although this is still a tea service, which was a very British, right, British custom, the in, Indians really didn't drink much tea before the, before the British came along um, and, and started the, the, the you know, the, the, the tea estates and, and such, bring tea from China. Um, but n not only, the point here is that it's not only ornament and decoration. Um, it, in fact, vessel forms change as well. And, and this is a tea service that is, is um, sort of imitating a local um, um, style of, of vessel making, which, which didn't have flat bottoms or feet, right? These are, these are rounded bottoms. Uh, rounded bottom uh, um, vessels which sit on 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 these little I don't know what to call them but but um, they're they're imitating basically little little round pieces of rope which which the Indian vessels would have sat on to keep them from toppling over so so you, the the British in India are are sort of acculturating 
um, um, their their sensibilities, um, both in terms of sort of surface, but then also in terms of, of form. I show you here essentially the same the same story. These are, are um, ewers um, vessels for water or wine, you know, and and some of them you know are are very Western in in terms of their in terms of their um, shape and form, but again, you know, with Hindu mythology um, on them, with these foliate vines and, and um, uh, the elephants, but then also even, you know, in this vessel type, you get adoption of, of local forms as well. This is a sort of classic um, Indo-Persian type vessel form, um, which sits on a saucer. Um, and then, and then also to say, it wasn't that, that the, the British weren't just taking their customs only and, and sort of Indianizing them, but they were also picking up very Indian customs. So it became very popular for um, the British when, when hosting lavish um, banquets to, to use the, the gulab posh, the, the um, rose water sprinkler. This became a great custom to sprinkle their guests uh, upon arrival or departure with rose water. And, and these, this um, is one of many examples of sort of Indian um, high culture being, the, those customs being adopted into British high culture in India. And the point I want to make, and, and I'll make with a couple slides here, is that it, this isn't a one-way street. So it's not just the British sort of becoming more and more uh, Indianized in, in, their, in their cultural forms, but, but the Indian elite, the, the princes of India, um, are doing the same thing. So, so they're, you know, they're taking on Western um, ideas and forms and trappings. These are a couple um, examples still uh, in the Virginia collection, of objects that were made for Indian Maharajas, um, which d in, in different ways are, are adopting um, Western forms. This is, this is a reduced scale reproduction of a, of a Greek statue that w had been dug up in Pompeii in the, in the um, Greek, but in Pompeii, I didn't miss, um, um, dug up in, I think, the 1860s. And um, we think that, that one of the Western Indian uh, Maharajas probably uh, commissioned a silversmith, a well-known silversmith, uh, to, to make a silver copy of, of the original, or rather a copy of the copy. Um, but, and this was probably headed for one of the great exhibitions uh, to showcase the, the, the skill of the Indian craftsmen within that realm. Um, Dionysus, um, also sometimes called Narcissus, but I, I believe it's actually supposed to be Dionysus. Um, and then likewise, a tea service here um, for use in one of the Indian royal courts. Um, and and I, I just love showing that because they're so cute. But a, 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 an Indian partridge. Um, is, is the form taken here. So the point is, um, this is, this is a, a two-way two street. Um, I've completely lost my place, so I'm just going to see if I... Um, okay. And so, and, and then this, here's an example in painting, another uh, object in, in the Virginia Museum, um, basically showing this, this um, sort of bi-directional um, um, hybridization. This, so this is an, uh, an Indian Raja, uh, in, again in Rajasthan, uh, Udaipur, holding court on the terrace of his palace at night. Um, that's the moon up there and stars and, and torches and lamps. But, but if you look at his palace, you realize how um, fashionable it had become by the mid and late 19th century when this was painted um, to use Western forms of, of architecture and of objects. If you, if you peer through these, these louvered windows with their little sort of Palladian 
imported Venetian glass um, tops. If you look through here, you see sort of Edwardian table and a mirror and a, and a, and a clock, all very you know, Western things, right next to a, a very Indian style um, um, or Jaroka, a, a sort of um, a place where the king would have showed him, shown himself um, um, to, to his court. Um, in, in this ceremony, he's seated on the low sort of Indian style throne, but at other points he would have shown himself up here, you know, right in between these very Western windows. You've got the very Indian style uh, balcony. Indian rulers, um, just um, another example of this, of um, depending on the ruler, um, there, there might have been sort of more or less of this adoption of, of, of Western forms. But one, one of the places we see it is in throne style. So this is the, the sort of classic Indian style throne, the low gutty um, placed on the ground. Um, whereas many uh, rulers move to Western style thrones as well. This is another um, image from the 1851 exhibition showing, I, I believe it's one of the um, Kerala rulers uh, thrones sort of set up um, in a sort of mock throne room. But this is the style that, that many uh, of the native rulers ad adopted. And some of them sort of just went whole hog on the thing. Um, this is the, the ruler of Abad or, or Lucknow, um, who took, he basically threw out his Indian titles and took Western titles, um, adopted the you know, very Western style uh, crown, started wearing ermine, ermine, um, um, you know, just, just really went for it. Um, had you know commissioned a Western artist uh, to make a, a new Western style throne for him with with a heraldic device, you know more stuff more sort of forms borrowed or um, adopted from from Europe. Um, so this is just to say that that these things are going uh, in both directions. And getting back to how it is, um, it's the the, the so like I say, you have Indian rulers uh, adopting Western styles and you have British rulers adopting Indian styles. Um, we have, and so, and so speaking about the Howdah in particular, we, we have um, pictures of, of Indian administrators um, from pretty early on writing in Howdahs. So um, this is James Todd, uh, uh, an officer of the East India Company. Um, riding in procession in Rajasthan uh, in 1817. So this is very early on in the 19th century. But the, but the British really, really t take on specifically the Howdah and more generally um, Indian court language, visual language of the Indian courts. They really, really take it on full bore um, with the beginning of the Raj period. Um, so this... Um, this show you know, so the 1850s, late 1850s. This is um, this is a howdah um, made for the first Indian viceroy, um, Lord Canning. Um, it was made for him when he undertook a series of tours in North India, as part of the sort of reestablishment of the political order um, in the wake of the mutiny um, in 1858 and 1859. Um, so this was specifically made for him, and this, and this, and so this is actually this is probably in the this was probably this is by William Simpson, a print from a William Simpson um, watercolor, um, probably done in the late 1850s. So um, and this halda apparently gets reused for decades to come um, by the viceroys. We we see it pop up again and again in photographs. This is actually this um, photograph is from your collection. Um, and probably 1870s, um, but the viceroy has reused this grand howdah that has um, it has British coat of arms on the side, and it has you know the crown at its center, and um, two figures here who are probably um, two uh, female figures who probably uh, symbolize Britannia. Um, um, so they they really get into the howdah thing in the wake of of. Or, or at the beginning of the Raj period. 
And this howda, as I say, gets used and used again, and then it pops up in, in, a, in an important event in 1877, um, which was the first of the imperial assemblages, or the, the so-called Delhi Durbars, um, and which I'll focus on a little bit here. Um, the, the imperial assemblage is, um, they, were, they were held to, to mark the, the coronations of, of the first three Indian emperors slash empresses. So the first one is held in 1877, soon after Victoria is declared empress of India. Um, and it's interesting that they used the term, Dur so they referred to them as the Durbars. Again, this is a, a borrowing of an Indian cultural form, um, specifically of the Mughals. Um, Durbars were uh, ceremonial, um, probably better, it, I, I think I put it on your, on your sheet, but um, ceremonies where, where the ruler holds court, basically, was a Durbar. And these grand um, assemblies were held to mark these coronations. And they took place, importantly, in Delhi. Okay, so the capital of the British at this point is still Calcutta. Um, but it's, uh, they, they are realizing that to, to really emphasize their, their power and their sort of, to, to cast themselves in the role of the, as the extension of the Mughals themselves, um, it was important that they hold these Durbars in Delhi at the, at the Mughal seat of power. And of course, the British are eventually going to move their, their seat there, but we'll get to that. Um, so this is 1877. Um, not a lot of photographs from, from, from this first one where Victoria, who did not travel to India, she never went to India, but in her stead, uh, the Viceroy um, um, was her representative in India. And they, the, the British officials with, with the Viceroy uh, at the head rode in on elephants, on, on um, howdahs. And they rode into this, this ground um, where arrayed in these, these two sort of semicircles were all of the, the native princes. So these sort of, the, 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 the kings, um, Variously called Raja, Maharaja, et cetera, et cetera, Nawab, um, of which I spoke earlier. Who so, sort of, when the crown rule came in, they had been sort of demoted. They now are officially called princes. They're they're allowed to run their kingdoms, but it's only um, with with you know in submission to to uh, the crown. Um, so. And, and as a part of this ceremony, which lasted for weeks, um, and there was much planning around, um, the Indian princes were all arrayed around, um, and, and basically this is just a straight up sort of act of submission to, to the crown uh, at the center. I mean, it's very sort of symbolically potent and obvious. Um, in 1903, we get the second of the Durbars, and it's to commemorate the coronation of Edward the the seventh. So Victoria dies in 1901, I believe. Um, Edward is crowned in 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 England, but it takes them a little while to plan the ceremonies. And so it's the tail end of 1902 and the first day of 1903 that the the second Durbar is held. And the viceroy at this point um, decides that the the Princes should be, there should be more involvement um, from the princes. And I apologize, this is, um, this is still 1877 here. So we do have a few photographs from 77. Um, you'll recognize these, these um, semicircular pavilions. And then this is this wonderful painting um, that is owned still by the queen. Um, and this does not do it justice. It's... Um, nearly the size of this wall, or the length of this wall, and it's beautifully painted. And, um, but this was the best, I think the queen keeps a tight grip on, on, on images on the web or something, because I searched and searched. Um, but um, this shows the princes, as I said, arrayed around, and they've all been given, um, um, the, the British saw fit to, to, to make armorial bearings um, um, 
coats of arms for, for, all the, for all the kingdoms. So they've all been given their Western style coats of arms. And here, and, and here they are sitting basically in submission to the viceroy. Sorry about that. Now I'll skip ahead to, to 1903. Um, you've always got to do it bigger and grander and better. So as you can see, it's grown quite a lot for the 1903 Durbar. But the, I was saying the viceroy um, thought that it was important for the native princes, as they were called, um, to be more, more conspicuously featured than they had been in the, in the previous iteration. And the, the, so, so here they are once they've gotten to, to the, um, the ground, but, but the, the, real, the real showstopper to this Durbar and the thing that we have a gazillion pictures of, you know, articles back in the Times in London, and, um, and you, it's actually kind of hard to find these pictures because what everybody's excited about is the grand entry, the, the state entry. And it featured, this is another print from your collection, um, it featured um, a long line of all the rulers or all of the, the, the significant rulers of India processing to that ground uh, upon their elephants and in their howdahs. And of course, at the head of the line, of course, is the viceroy. Um, and then you have, I forget, somebody important, for another, another important dignitary from England. And then only then do you have sort of in, in, in order of importance, you have the long line of, of Indian princes, and this went on for hours and hours and hours, and, and clearly was a big splash here and then back at home as well. Um, one writer wrote at the time, the most splendid and dazzling, the most bewildering and spectacular feature of the entire Durbar was the state entry, which included this parade of 219 of the largest and most stately elephants in all of India, richly and extravagantly caparisoned in gold and silver and richest silks, and ridden by their princely owners dressed in Durbar costumes, sparkling with priceless gems. I mean, and this, you know, that's one of a thousand um, sort of eulogies, uh, uh, panegyrics about, about this grand procession. And it really sort of sticks in the mind, I think, of, of, of the empire back home. And finally, the third of these Durbars in 1911 to commemorate the coronation of George V. Now, um, Edward VII didn't show up either. That's why the Viceroy was at the head of that, of that train. Um, George makes it there um, in 1911. So, so he gets to sit, he and, and the Queen Alexandra something? Mary, Mary, Mary. Um, sit, you know, in the pavilion. Um, and as you can see, it's grown now to magnificent size. You have basically stadium seating for God knows what the, what the circumference is there. Um, and the princes, one by one, um, come and, and, and uh, do a little sort of curtsy uh, to the emperor and empress in, in the royal pavilion at the center of it all. Um, there is less documentation for 1911 of the, of the grand procession. Um, there, are, there are, okay, here, here we have, here they are seated here, and here's one of the, the, the native princes curtsying. Um, another thing that they pick up um, directly from the Mughal sort of uh, ideas of, of, of kingship um, is that George and Mary um, go to the Red Fort in Delhi, the, 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 the real seat of, of the former Mughal power. Um, they go to the ramparts of the Red Fort and, and show themselves um, in this, this sort of darshan, um, this sort of exchange um, um, between ruler and ruled, uh, uh, an important custom um, for you know, for at least many, at least several centuries in India, so they're they're taking this this um, again this visual language of power directly from from the Mughals. Um, these are a, a couple of of the few images of the procession for 1911 that we have, and. You don't see a lot of elephants. Um, at this point, it's 1911, everybody's feeling very modern. Um, carriages are the thing. 
carriages are in, elephants are out. Um, um, but, but there are accounts, there were elephants as well, but, but, but fewer of them. It was really that 1903 Durbar that was sort of the grandest of the elephant processions. And so I just wanted to show you another amazing painting, which you will probably remember from the Maharaja show. Um, showing that 1903 procession, again, um, with the viceroy at the head um, and, and the native princes. And this is another big, if you remember one big fatty painting at the, uh, in the exhibition, this was it. Um, by Roderick McKenzie, 1907. So, I'm, we're almost to our break, but I want to I wanna start zooming back into the howdahs themselves now that we've got a lot of context. Um, and looking at, the, at, at, at your howdah and the Virginia howdah at the same time, I um, just want to point out generally, you know, pretty obvious but important um, ways in which um, we see in these howdahs this sort of visual um, um, display of combining Indian and European and really more universal than that, notions of royalty and authority. So um, we, of course, have all these motifs of these regal beasts, all right? So you've got lions, um, you've got composite creatures. So, I mean, these lions in the back you can't see very well. I've got another uh, sort of side view in, uh, it's somewhere here that you'll see. These are straight up lions. These are um, sort of griffin lions, you know, which have been given wings and, and almost um, horns and such. But regal creatures, whether they're lions, um, attacking, you know, and, and, and um, um, attacking prey. Um, what, here there are, there are fish and kind of a, a, a mythical f sort of fish. Um, here the lion is attacking um, a water buffalo. But then peacocks as well, very important, long-standing, ancient um, um, symbol of, of royalty in India was the peacock. But again, these, these peacocks, um, they appear several many times on your howdah, and I'll show more images of them. These peacocks, again, have sort of become um, um, hybridized, sort of, um, um, what's the word? Um, composite creatures, much like the griffins, you know, so they're, it's kind of a peacock, but it's kind of a lion, and it's kind of this, and it's kind of that. Um, here we go. Um, these are more peacocks. On, so the, these, are, these two are details of, of the San Francisco Halda. Um, you see peacocks again featuring prominently in, in f they're, they're, and I'll show them again, but there are four big roundels on the sides of, of your Halda that show these adorced peacocks um, on either side of a sort of flowing, you know, um, bountiful vase with, with foliage and flowers growing out of it. Um, but, and, and here you have griffins on, on, on your uh, halda as well, as well as a lion head. Um, and then also, um, importantly, um, other, other symbols of, of royalty and, and ones taken really from the, the, the European context. So coats of arms, um, which the coat, the, 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 the shield on, on your howdah is, it's unclear, and I'll come back to, to what we can and cannot make of it. But, this is, but that this is a Western-style heraldic shield is obvious, um, right? So these, these symbols, whether they're Indian, sort of coming out of the Indian context or the European context, um, symbology of, of, of royalty and authority. This, um, here you see some better details showing you the lion here and more the griffin here attacking its prey. Uh, these, of course, are of the Virginia howda. Um, um, but the, the same sort of vocabulary of, of, of uh, royal um, grand animals, kings of animals, um, which, of course, the king would have been inside, you know, riding within and surrounded by. Um, Th 
This is just a little bit better view of one of these roundels, which I'll come back and talk about a little bit more later with, with the peacocks, a little bit larger view of that. And, and a view of the front of the Virginia howda, which is, this, this is gonna be very important for our second half after the break, which is coming up. Um, whereas the crest, the shield on the front of the, of the Asian Art Museum's howda is very unclear, it's not at all unclear on, on the, or, or, or it, it's rather clear on the Virginia howda. So um, we have the rampant lions and they're, they're holding a monogram of some sort which is unintelligible, but I'll get back to that. But then this is the, this is the most important part is this uh, sort of ribbon that, that is under the lions and it tells us um, very clearly where this howl is from. So it gives the Latin, again, interested in, in European stuff, it gives the Latin motto um, virtute et fide, um, virtue and um, strength, strength. I know it's on here somewhere, but who knows? Um, um, virtue and faith. Sorry, I'm sure somebody said that. Virtue and faith. My Latin's a little rusty, um, but so it gives. This is the state motto of this state right here, Serguja. So. It is because of this little bit, or rather this, this whole bit, this is why both the Virginia Halda and the San Francisco Halda have been assigned to this state, Serguja. And, and as I say, I'll be returning to this. Note also, instead of the lion head up top here, we have a, a solar, this is, a, this is the sun basically with a human face. Um, so a sort of different dynastic emblem above than on the San Francisco howda. Um, this, is, this is another um, example of the seal of Serguja. This is taken from a, 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 an invitation card to a Durga Puja, um, a, a religious event, um, being hosted by one of the Serguja um, uh, Maharajas. Maharajas. Um, his name is here, um, um, Saran Singh. Um, Ramanuj Saran Singh. Um, but here we get it again, Virtute Fide, and the rampant lions, the solar motif, and a much better, uh, better preserved uh, monogram here, which, which corresponds to who we're being told is the specific Maharaja. Um, this, these are his, it says M.R. Maharaja um, Saran Singh Deo. Okay, so, but this is just an, another example of the Sirkuja crest. Um, I want to wrap up so that we can take a break, um, but I just want you to consider just, just for a moment how different the, the, the front-facing uh, pieces of these two haldas are, and, and fear not, I will show them again. So, when we come back, so we're going to take a break, but when we come back from the break, um, what I want to do is focus down more tightly on these two howdas and, and examine them more thoroughly and see what that might reveal about their specific histories and how it sort of jives with, with what we've said all along and how maybe it calls some things into question and helps us refine what we know about these, about yours and our objects. So thank you. <laughs> 